Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship, which we'll read responsively. We gather to worship the Good Shepherd, who lays down his life for his sheep. We gather to worship Jesus Christ, who lay down and lies for others. Easter people, Christ is risen. Our first hymn is uh, number 761, called as Partners in Christ's Service. I'll be reading the um, words to the hymn. You can, hum, you can hum along. <laughs> called as Partners in Christ's Service called the ministries of grace. We respond with deep commitment, fresh new lines of faith to trace. May we learn the art of sharing, side by side and friend with friend. Equal partners in our caring to fill God's chosen end. Christ example, Christ inspiring. Christ's clear call to work and worth. Let us follow, never faltering reconciling folk on earth. Men and women, richer, poorer, all God's people, young and old, blending human skills together, gracious gifts from God unfold. Thus new patterns for Christ's mission in a small or global sense. Help us bear each other's burdens, breaking down each wall or fence. Words of comfort, words of vision, words of challenge, said with care. Bring new power and strength for action. Make us colleagues, free and fair. So God grant us for tomorrow ways to order human life that surround each person's sorrow with a calm that conquers strife. Make us partners in our living, our compassion to increase. Messengers of faith, thus giving hope and confidence and peace. Please uh, join me in the prayer of confession. God, you give us the opportunity to be neighbors who are members of one family, blessed with great diversity. You create us to be helpers and friends to one another, entrusting to us your justice and your joy. Yet we have denied justice and joy to many creating worlds of poverty, pain, lost opportunities, and absence of hope. In so many ways, we break each other's hearts. Still, you do not reject us. We ask your forgiveness.
Friends, know that you are forgiven. Know that our God is a God of grace and understanding. When we open our hearts, God gives us the courage and the strength to live out our faith with those we encounter in the world. And now hear the prayer of illumination. Holy God, you have called us to follow in the way of your risen son and to care for those who are our companions, not only with words of comfort, but with acts of love. Seeking to be true friends of all, we offer our prayers on behalf of the church and the world. Amen. The first scripture reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. Hear the word of the Lord. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is first of all? Jesus answered, this is first. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe sent, said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there are no others. And to love him with all your heart, and with all your understanding, and with all strength, and to love one's neighbors as oneself. This is much more important than all who, bur who burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you, you are not far from the kingdom of God, and that no one dared to ask him any question. Thanks, Dave. So I think the reading from Luke really builds on what Mark started. There's a real connection between these two scriptures. And I've chosen to read from the Message Bible, which is the Bible we share with our youth here at the church. Just then, a religious scholar stood up with a question to test Jesus. Teacher, what do I need to do to get into eternal life? He answered, what is written in God's law? How do you interpret it? He said, that you love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and muscle and intelligence, and that you love your neighbor as well as you do yourself. Good answer, said Jesus. Do it and you'll live. Looking for a loophole, the scholar asked, and how would you define neighbor? Jesus answered by telling a story. There once was a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, on the way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, beat him up, and went off, leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road, but when he saw him, he angled across to the other side. Then a Levite religious man showed up. He also avoided the injured man. A Samaritan traveling the road came on him. When he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. He gave him first aid, bandaged his wounds, then he lifted him onto his donkey, led him to an inn, and made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take good care of him. If it costs any more, put it on my bill. I'll pay you on my way back. What do you think? Which of these three became a neighbor to the man attacked by the robbers? The one who treated him kindly. The religious scholar responded, Jesus said, go and do the same. So I have always enjoyed the love story of my parents, Clifford and Lena. He was a West Virginia boy who traveled to Baltimore, Maryland to work in an airplane factory at the beginning of World War II. 
and his goal was to become an engineer. She was the daughter of an, um, Italian immigrants and worked as a secretary in the Pentagon. When he was drafted to the army and arrived in Europe to defend the country he loved, he promised he would return, become an engineer, and marry her. What happened in Europe would have him return to the States called to serve a pa as a pastor. That's a whole nother story. Then they packed their bags so he could take the offer of a free education at David and Elkins, where he, she would become the college president's secretary and he would prepare to be a pastor. Fast forward to their four children and their service to the Bluffton, Ohio Presbyterian Church. One of my strongest memories of their Bluffton ministry is a family that we would now call homeless, knocking on the man's door. It was not hard to find the addresses of the pastors in the town. They were listed in something you might recall called a phone book. On that day, that family knocked on our door and asked for help. My mother was the only adult in the house that day. My father was in the study at the church located near the manse. Without hesitation that I can recall, my mother opened the door, made sure everybody had a good lunch, some time to rest, time for the children to play with we four children, and my, then my father arrived to a very full house. Two things stay with me from that day with our guests. When the, my, they left, my mother washed everything and hung it on the clothesline. I now realize she had acted outside her comfort zone that day, but it didn't stop her from living her faith. The second thing I remember is that the family shared that before they had arrived at our door, they had stopped at two other pastors' houses only to be turned away. Our home was the third stop, and our mother was the first one to open the door. Thus, today's scripture reading from the book of Luke. My mother was the third man on that road, the Good Samaritan, not only on the day of our visitors, but throughout her faith journey. The Good Samaritan has surely been taught from every pulpit multiple times. The scripture shows that the story is in response to that question Jesus received from the Jewish religious scholar, who is my neighbor? The parable is the answer to that question. One of the twists is the Samaritan was not favored by the Jews. He's a despised enemy of the Jews. You would expense since Jesus is speaking to a G Jewish scholar the good guy in the story would be one of them. That's like telling this congregation that the OSU fan is the bad guy and the Michigan fan was the good guy. That's pretty risky. Ironically, the first two men were a priest and a Levite. The Levite tribe was chosen by God to care for the temple, and the priests were chosen by, by the people to worship God. However, Jesus chose to make them the ones who walked by without stopping. In our society today, they would be the ones that didn't look up from their phone or they were, they were filming it to put on YouTube, one of the two. Man three stepped up to the plate. He stopped to help. He took the injured man to an inn and he made sure that he received the help that he needed. An article in Biblio, Biblical, I knew I was gonna do that, Biblical Archaeology Society shares that a man's action in the parable reminds us that those we see as enemies are still our neighbors. That compassion must have no boundaries and not to judge people or choose our actions by our religion or other factors that tend to divide us rather than unite us. Sounds to me like a parable written for our current world situation. A reminder that boundaries between people are barriers to understanding our fellow man. It is worthy of note that the Good Samaritan helps someone who probably could not return the favor. He, like each of us, lived in a world that expects rewards for our efforts, a world where it's easy to help someone who looks like us. He chose to do what was right without worrying about boundaries set by society. Referring to this parable, Martin Luther King Jr. said, on the parable of the Good Samaritan, I imagine the first question the priest and Levite asked themselves was, if I stop to help this man, what might happen to me? But by the very nature of his concern, the Good Samaritan reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? That truly sums up how we can think about those in need who we encounter, whom we encounter. The religious man asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? 
The third man did not answer that question with, people like me, my demographic. He simply saw a man in need. The reading of chapter 12 of Mark shares a question to Jesus from yet another religious scholar. Which is most important of all these commandments? Jesus answers with both to love God and love others as you love yourself. The love of Jesus can also be seen in our parable, giving something else for us to consider as we reflect on this message. Jesus himself is our good Samaritan. He picks us up, walks beside us on the road of life, pays our debts, and carries us home to safety. His love is offered to us in the highest level of love, a love that is totally unselfish and seeks nothing in return. Our God loves us unconditionally and calls us to do the same. The Good Samaritan is Jesus' reminder of what a faith journey can truly be because he has always modeled being the third man on the road. Like the road of our faith journey is a story shared by so many years ago by our Jesus. We pass so many things, so many people, so many opportunities and challenges every day of our lives. We understand the concept of opportunities in our careers, in our social lives, and in our family events. It's also worthy to consider the opportunities of our faith journey that we have missed. Maybe you were sitting in a Sunday Bible study and someone in the room expressed a need. You have the resources and talents to help that person, but I don't know them well. I don't have time. I feel uncomfortable. You pass them by, so to speak. We might all consider putting our faith in the front seat of our car and our fears in the back seat as we travel our faith journey. I can think of so many faith opportunities I have missed, sometimes out of fear. Those of you gathered here today may also be thinking of those times, and hopefully thinking of times you've stopped along the road to help. You've become the third man. We are human. Our priorities may be what the world gives us rather than what we can give the world. At this moment in time, we have opportunities arriving on a daily basis if we're truly paying attention. One evening, we took our middle school, age, our middle school children to downtown Athens for dinner at a favorite restaurant. Walking back up Court Street, Steve and I both noted a rather scary-looking vagabond walking toward us. One of us asked, just like the Levite, should we move to the other side of the street? We did not. As the man passed our family, we said a brief hello. He stopped, came closer, and said, Mr. and Mrs. Dietz, it's Sean. I loved your classes. We were so humbled. Why do we fear those we encounter? Why do only those who dress like us and look like us and think like us are those we spend our time with. Do we all look alike in the church we attend? Does a Thursday night dinner allow us to classify the folks as them and us in attendance? Or do we seek the body of Christ gathered together like that first Monday Thursday so long ago? We must be willing to open our hearts and faith to everyone on the road, not to pass by, to stop, to go to the level that allows us to look in the eyes of those who are in need and reach out our hands in faith. Our congregation is on that road right now. We're about to have a person in our pulpit every Sunday. It might be prudent to consider that person as a Band-Aid, helping us to grow, to heal, to move forward. We must also accept that we are the congregation, the church. Remember this, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door, there's the people, we are the congregation. We are the church. We are the people, the heart, the soul, and the life of Christ represented here in this place. Let us not go naively into this change for our congregation so we can honor the saints that have gone before us and prepare for the folks who will follow in this congregation. We simply have things to do. Folks we know haven't returned to the pews. Are we on the men of the road that can look at that empty pew in which they always sat right now, in this moment in time, in this sanctuary, and walk by without stopping to help? Or are we the third man on the road who stops, reaches out, and offers them guidance? 
Remember something you used to do for the church or community? Is it time you offer your talents again? Do you see something that could make the life of this congregation more open to all, enriching to a small group, or simply better for the people in the pews? How will we be the third man? We are not too young. We are not too old. In the words of Goldilocks, we are just right. What can we do? We can all take a moment to think about what has brought us to these pews and kept us here. Why am I attending here as a member of this congregation? Because of the many third men that I have encountered in this sanctuary. Forty years ago, Marge Dollison called me soon after we moved to Logan, invited me to choir practice, picked me up so I'd not arrive alone, and has sung next to me for all those years. It was Linda Hayward who asked me to lunch. I was too shy to say yes, but I was really amazed someone would ask me to lunch. It was David Spencer who asked me to sing a solo, or the worship committee who asked me to do a children's sermon. It was Galen Work who was always ready for a lively conversation and modeled the third man on the streets of Logan, never afraid to share his faith with a passerby. And Lucy Shaw, who believed that faith had work clothes on and made sure we could all make something happen. It was Kathy Crumloff who invited my children to um, youth group and made it a special time. It's Roger and Donna Hines who have supported us in recent months as we've faced a challenge or two. We can all be that compassionate third man to help someone to see the value of being part of this congregation and give them reason to stay. As a Presbyterian ordained, Mr. Rogers once suggested, just take 10 seconds to think about the people who have made you who you are. Let me pause 10 seconds so you can do that. Now, to add to Mr. Rogers' thoughtful suggestion, take 10 seconds to think about who you can help understand who they are, to discover faith, to find comfort in who you are to them, to be their third man. We are on the road of a life lived in faith. We can look back with regret as long as we use that to motivate our future walk to become more brisk as we move forward. We can pay attention to those we encounter, to those that have fallen by the wayside, to those who reach out to us, to those who will walk with us. It will happen this week, you know. An opportunity related to your faith journey will present itself. Will we pass by or will we be the third man who stops, shares, cares, and continues to walk with someone? I was blessed to have parents who modeled their faith in action. I was taught it was quite easy to close the door to a stranger. However, our faith must be in the business of opening doors. May this week bring you opportunities to open doors. Simply, we can choose to live our lives as the third man on the road. And I think the hymn we're about to encounter certainly captures that.
Let us pray. Sisters and brothers in Christ, God invites you to bring our doubts and fears, your joys and concerns, your petitions and praise, and offer them for earth and all its creatures. We thank you for the road of life you have given each one of us and for the opportunities our faith allows in the world in which we live. Help us live our faith without fear each day. We lay the burdens of our brothers and sisters at your feet. We pray for those who face illness that you may offer them comfort and hope. We pray for those who are discouraged that you bring them joy. We pray for those who grieve that your arms may surround them in their hour of need. Hear the prayers in each of our hearts for those we hold dear. Comfort and support us as we lift our individual concerns for those we have encountered. Lord, we celebrate those who have gathered together in the sanctuary of your word in this time and place. We ask that you guide each of us in this day and the week that you will be with us in the road of our faith journey. We pray for the future of this congregation as we await the arrival of the person whom you have chosen to guide us in the coming months and years. Receive these prayers, O God, and transform us through them, that we may, eyes to, may, that we may have eyes to see and hearts to understand not only what you do on our behalf, but also what you call us to do. Lord, thy will be done. We thank you for this moment in time as those gathered lift their voices together in the words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, announcements, we have some birthdays this week. Barbara Wright, I hear you have a birthday this week. Is that true? And I think Julie Davis does too. Right, sound man? So any other birthdays? If you've run into Jeff King, it's his birthday this week, and he's had quite a year. So if you're in the mood to drop a card, he'd be a good person to drop a card too. All right, any other announcements? The quiet congregation. All right, this week the church will open for the scouts. It will open for the deacons to meet together and the handbell choir to practice. So it's just great that the doors are opening during the week too and we've got a little business going on. I leave you with a benediction. Each of us chose to be gathered here today whether it's through the vessel of the internet or in person. We chose not to pass by on the road that leads to this sanctuary. Once again, we will leave this sanctuary through doors that open to the world. As we travel the streets and highways of the week ahead of us, let us be reminded of Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. I then heard the verse, voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah replied, Here I am. Send me. May God be with you. Amen.